I came to Santa Fe in 1965. I had just graduated medical school and finished a rotating internship. I thought I knew everything, uh, an occupational hazard for many newly minted physicians. And I came here with the caricatured pedigree of the mid-60s, and I joined the Indian Health Service as an alternative to going to Southeast Asia. I didn't know a whole lot about Native Americans. I cheered for their side in the movie, but I didn't know a whole lot. So this was uh, a first-time experience for me. I did. I went back for my training in psychiatry in New Haven, and then I came back to the Southwest. This is where I lost my heart. And for the next 16 years, I was the chief of psychiatry for the Indian Health Service and the Phoenix Indian Medical Center. They do. The first book, The Dancing Healers, is essentially a transformational journey. What happens to this young, arrogant physician, which are often synonymous terms, and what it is he learned about, what he thought he knew everything about. It is the education of a physician about how to make the transition from doctor to healer. The second book, The Theft of the Spirit, is not a personal transformational journey. It's how people can use the material themselves to face the ordinary transitions in their lives and also the potential catastrophes. It is, I think, you know, that's an interesting point. It is my personal belief that the whole history of civilization would be different if we only viewed the people that ultimately we conquered as having some information to share with us. Instead, the history of civilization is unfortunately repetitive. We think that because they lost and we, whoever we is, won, that we have nothing to learn from those people. And the truth is that indigenous people have known something about healing and the use of pharmaceuticals, herbs, for a thousand years. Well, actually, Phoenix was a central referral source for all of the reservation communities in Arizona. The Navajo had their own health service delivery system and their own psychiatrist, but certainly many urban Navajo people I was involved with. I flew a small plane to most of the reservations in the state regularly, making clinic visits, and then stayed in Phoenix, a referral hospital. The Hopi are still connected in a very real way to a place where they have emerged, at least in this general area, the oldest continuously inhabited villages in this continent, carbon dated back to 1,900 years ago, continuously inhabited villages on the Hopi reservation. Those people who make it in contemporary life are those who maintain some connection to something they believe in, just like the Hopi have sustained themselves. That in spite of the great changes in our civilization and the advances in our technology, the Hopi are still a sole surviving taproot to a traditional worldview, a cosmology, that has sustained them in peace. I think that what happened in Hopi land is that there's been a setup between traditionalists and progressives. What's happened is that when the federal government came, it was difficult for them to deal with traditional religious leaders who held a seat of government. So essentially, they created a different kind of government. And unfortunately, it set up the community into two different groups. Part of that has been extremely destructive. And some of the stories that we talk about in the book are how those connections that have sustained a people for thousands of years are becoming distorted because of changes in expectation and the new politicization of a community whose traditional leadership has lost some of its influence. There are, I mean, there are many ways that we have been unkind, but competition for living space rarely breeds good neighborliness. I mean, Columbus did not discover America. I hope that comes as no great surprise. I mean, Columbus discovered America like somebody walking down the street, seeing the keys to your car in the ignition, and then driving it away, saying that he or she discovered it. That's how Columbus discovered America. There were people here for a long time. The truth is that uh, the history of the last hundred years, longer, has been a history of disenfranchisement and neocolonialism and psychohistorical discontinuity. And that has not sat well in Indian country. Well, that's an interesting story I hadn't heard before about Universal Studios. But it does bespeak a principle that says how you see it may not be the way it is. The way you see it is just the way you see it. But it doesn't mean it's the way it is. Other people are going to look at the same material see it differently. And I think that's an interesting point. Because I think that many times we get trapped in some perception that we have and then we're unwilling to give it up. In the book, I tell the story of a man who was facing very serious disease. I was in a group of people who were all looking at catastrophic illness, people who had cancer, people who had devastating disease. And this was a self-help group. Everybody in it was looking at some imminent potential disaster. One man in the group 
in his early 30s, had discovered three weeks before that he had a cancer of the liver, a primary hepatoma, and was told that he needed liver transplant. I mean, here's a man who was essentially healthy and discovered by accident while picking up his child that he had a lump in his side. They did needle biopsy. It was found to be a primary tumor. And now he was facing surgery in which he had a 50-50 chance of operative success. And in the group, he wept and said, I was healthy three weeks ago. I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. At which point, another person in the group, a man in his late 20s who had just sustained a marrow transplant for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a man who had been on his deathbed and who ultimately had a remission, had an operation, and now was thriving. And he came up to him and touched him and said, this is my story, and this is where I was. And he said, I said the same thing you did. I did not believe there was a light at the end of the tunnel, that I was going to drown, I was going to die. And he said, let me tell you what it is that I have discovered. The light at the end of the tunnel is not an illusion. The tunnel is. It turns out that it's how you come to it, not how it comes to you. It doesn't matter what we face. It matters only that we choose to look again at what it is we thought we knew, rather than to be certain that the way we see it is the only way it is. I don't know that your, your viewers are familiar with it, but Plato tells this wonderful story, an allegory of slaves and caves. And it's exactly like that. He says slaves are, are people who sit on a bench looking at shadows cast from the opening to the cave up against a blank slate wall so that their view of life is all shadow. If you were to take the chains off the slave and allow them to look at the light from a different perspective, to see the objects not just as reflected shadows, then you could see life from a whole different perspective. He says you are enslaved when, when the chains are off, you choose not to look at the light, but only see shadows. Most of us become chained by the shadows of our preconception rather than to look at the light from another perspective. Bad Billy, well, I don't know what that has to do with drinking and DWI and, and different pipes, but I do think, as a general rule, the surrounding makes a difference in how we come to it. So if people are joyful and happy, that it has some impact on how we see the world. But that's true generally, whether we're drinking or not. I think if you surround yourself by people who believe and have joy and who come to life with the experience of every new day as a new possibility, that that has impact. And if you hang around a depressive atmosphere, that that too rubs off. I mean, our grandparents knew this. It doesn't take great genius. Now, here's an interesting story. Doctors are trained in this country, by and large, to come to patients with good head. That is, our knowledge is exceptional, and we are scientifically and technologically extremely well-trained. And sometimes that's real helpful. I mean, if you have a detached retina, you want to know somebody who can use a laser beam to reattach it. But most of the practice of medicine is a much more human exchange, and most of our training de-emphasizes how we come to patients as individuals because we are supposed to maintain a dispassionate objectivity. That is, we should keep ourselves a little bit detached so it doesn't impair our clinical judgment. Our heads are well trained. I once went to Belize. I was there on a vacation with my family and I happened to go to some Mayan ruins and I asked the guide whether there were any Mayan healers left. I happened to be interested in traditional healing and he said it just so happened that his uncle was the last surviving full-blood Mayan healer. And it just so happens, one of those coincidences, that are probably destined, that he lived in a village on the way back to our hotel, that we just happened to be driving through, so I just happened to stop. And he was holding clinic hours. There were people in an orange grove waiting to see him in a shack about four foot by five foot covered with banana palm fronds. Just a bench, actually, and a table on which was a candle and some copal incense. When my turn came, I went in with the driver who helped me speak in my elementary Spanish, but I didn't want to take up too much time. There were a lot of people waiting to see him, so I wanted to cut to the quick and ask him the really crucial questions. So this 93-year-old man, whose name was Don Leo Ponti, who was declared a national treasure, by the way, by the Belizean government, and who was wearing a tradition Mayan white blouse that was embroidered and white pants tied with a rope belt and barefooted, I'm looking at him and I say to him, 
I'm a physician, I work with indigenous people, I'm interested in healing, and I would like to ask you, what's the most important thing you've learned that enables you to be a healer? I mean, in all these years, what's the most important thing that you have learned that enables you to heal? And the old man thinks about the question and finally says, through my interpreter, that the most important thing he's learned that enables him to heal is not to take a cold drink on a hump day on an empty stomach. The interpreter tells me this and I look at him with disbelief. Don't take a cold drink on a hot day on an empty stomach. That's the most important thing he's learned. So I'm sure that he has asked the question badly or that somehow it was misinterpreted. I said, ask him again. So he asked him again, what's the most important thing you've learned that enables you to heal? And the old man looks at me smiling and says, the most important thing he's learned is don't take a cold drink on an empty stomach on a hot day. So I ask him, Por qué? Why? And the old man says, because it gives you bad belly. Bad belly. I still don't know what he means. So I say, what do you mean bad belly? And he says, uh, you can't treat patients with bad belly. You have to come to patients with a good belly. And I understand this now. Most of us who are trained in Western medicine come to our patients at best with no belly at all. Good head, no belly. We are objective, we are detached, we are distanced, but we don't know our people, and they don't know us. They know the genius of our technology, but not the essence of our heart and spirit. It's very important to come to patients not only with good head, but with good belly too. I think that part of the problem we see in contemporary life, in terms of increases in malpractice suits and the whole litigious atmosphere, is because we have separated and distanced ourselves from patients. We've become so technically adept by compartmentalizing patients into their body parts, so now we only relate to their eyes or their livers or their gastrointestinal system, but we don't spend any time talking to people. The great crisis in medicine, and the reason I think that people are looking for alternatives, is because they can't spend enough time with their doctors who make them feel as if they truly care about who they are, not just what they've got. Well, I think that basically, you know, now we're talking about healthcare delivery in this country as an issue of managed competition. Now, did you ever hear a phrase that has less healing a quality to it? Bad belly. As if somehow medicine can be practiced as a managed competitive arena. I think that more and more, both doctors and patients recognize that the joy that comes from healing relationships has to do with how we come together. I think that more and more my colleagues have become trapped by the business of medicine, by the management of our competition, or by the reimbursement from third-party payers, and it steals our spirit. That the reasons that most of us come into healing professions are because we care truly about people and we would like to make a difference in their lives. But the management of medicine by all kinds of influences outside of that relationship now impact on what it is we can do with people, how long they can be hospitalized, what diagnoses are reimbursed for whether or not an individual can have an extended stay. All of it colludes in managing the practice of medicine as some kind of an administrative exchange rather than a human condition. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Lots of Native people felt badly that the hantavirus was called the Navajo illness or the Navajo flu. I mean, that kind of judgmentalism, like you could catch it from a Native person. There are cases in which I have relatives who refuse to be served at restaurants because people were afraid that they would catch it. That kind of judgmentalism uh, is very hard to bear in Indian country, and they're very sensitive. The interesting thing with the hantavirus is that from a Western perspective, and in New Mexico, the state has been involved enormously, and state epidemiologists have made statements that Native people have heard as, stop practicing your traditional ways. Whether it was said or not, I'm not sure, but how it was heard was, stop dancing. The hantavirus seems to be spread by rodent droppings. And the Western way of looking at this is get rid of the rodents or eliminate the pathogen, the virus itself. That's the way. So that if you dance, you can render the droppings airborne and now you can more easily breathe them in. So you understand from a Western perspective that to eliminate doing some rituals, for example, would be a way to control the epidemic. Now to paraphrase from a native perspective, this is a short-sighted view. The traditional Navajo people to whom I speak, they laugh when they think about stopping to dance. They think they have to dance more. Why? They think that treating the hantavirus by either eliminating the rats 
or by finding a vaccine against the virus or some chemical to treat it is a short-sighted view. It's like treating the fever of leukemia by giving aspirin. You take the fever away, but it doesn't do anything for the underlying disease. Bad belly. The old people, they say, the reason that we're seeing hantavirus is because we are not taking good care of this earth and we have not taught our stories to our children well. We have not taught our language and our stories. We have not taught them that what it is that has allowed us to sustain ourselves as a people since the beginning of time is to perpetuate not only our language, but our cosmology, how we see the world. And the reason that we are seeing changes in climate is because we have not served our role as caretakers of the earth well enough. They believe that in order for us to deal with the hantavirus, they have to dance more. Why? We have lost touch and connection with the idea that to get well doesn't just mean to eliminate virus. It means that you're going to have to treat the place much better. Our bodies cannot be well if the air that we breathe is not well, if the waters of the Rio Perco are distorted because of uranium tailings, if our groundwaters are becoming contaminated, if there are programs that bury nuclear waste in the earth of New Mexico, and that the potential is that if we don't take good care of the earth, it's not going to take good care of us. You can't be healthy if your heart and lungs are in good shape, if you do all kinds of marathon running. You can't be healthy if the air you breathe is contaminated and poisoned or the water you drink or if there's global warming causing changes in temperature or changes in the ozone layer so that we have skin cancers here that are 10 times the national average. We need to take better care of the place. The old people, they see themselves as caretakers of the entire universe, not just the Navajo tribe. And that the reason that we are seeing these outbreaks, these epidemics, has something to do with not taking good care of this place, this earth mother place. To deal with the virus is not going to change what it is we're facing as a civilization. They knew that there would come a disease, and they knew it would come this year, because the pinyons were in bloom for months, and the extended season had something to do with increased rainfall. And what happened was that undoubtedly the rats have been multiplying because of a plentiful food supply. So what we may be seeing in terms of the antivirus may say something simply about an increase in the rat population in a virus that may have always been present. The way to deal with antivirus is not solely eliminating rats, but to look at what it is we're doing to the earth. Otherwise, we will never sustain ourselves as a people. So you we know. need to dance more. Good head and good body means that you have to stay connected inside, that what you know with your head and what you feel in your gut are equally important. Don't lose sight of the fact that most of us only believe what we know, that which can be experimentally proven. And we tend to minimize that which we can learn because we feel, because we intuit it. Pay attention to your gut, to your belly. The truth is always closer to what you feel in your heart than what you know in your head. Because the heart knows things the mind never thought of. The heart, you see, has not yet been crippled with self-doubt. So if you want to pay attention to what's really important, pay attention to the voice in here. And then use it to make a difference in your life. No, that's a complicated question that belies a short answer. But basically, when we escalate the value of traditional art, sometimes people steal it and sell it. And we see that happening with increasing frequency. One's birth rate, one's spirit becomes exploited as a marketable commodity, and they are disappearing. Thank you, Ernie. Nice to be with you.